Good afternoon and welcome to our first of four parts of our Mental Health Awareness Month, ensuring that eating disorders are part of the conversation. We are so happy that you are joining us here today. Um, we look forward to an amazing conversation with some amazing humans that I'm so lucky to call friends and um, collaborators. Um, so really, really excited for our conversation today with the amazing Jess Sprangle and the phenomenal Mina B. Um, we're gonna hold until um, they join, um, but in the meantime, we're really excited to share um, our all of our plans for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, like I said, this is the, the first of four important conversations that we were, are having once a week for the entire month of May, um, starting with today um, and leading up to next week and every week after that. So we are, um, we're gonna wait a minute. Um, I think I both see Mina and um, and Jess have joined, so I'm gonna accept. And uh, hopefully we can get them on this conversation soon. So thank you all for being here. Really looking forward. Hey friend, hello. hello. Hi. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to be with like two of my most favorite humans in the world. Thank you so much both for being here, for being part of this very important conversation, ensuring that eating disorders are part of the general mental health conversation during Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, so for the few folks that might be on this that might not know you fabulous, fabulous humans, um, I am so honored to welcome the wonderful Mina B and the incredible Jess Sprangle. So would love, um, Mina, for you to take a few moments and share a little bit about you and all the fabulous things you do. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Hi, everyone. My name is Mina B. I am a former therapist. I used to treat clients who struggle with depression, anxiety, and trauma. And I transitioned into becoming a corporate wellness coach. And so now I work with organizations on a whole um, by helping them become psychologically safe and mental health inclusive. I'm also a writer. I am a contributing writer for Well and Good. And I'm also currently writing a book. So it is slated to be released in summer of 2023 next year through Penguin, Ra Penguin Random House. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank you for having me, Joanna. Yes, doing all the things. And I'm going to shamelessly plug that you are one of our fabulous collaborative members, and we are so happy to have you on board. Um, Jess, would love to have you share a little bit about you. Well, uh, hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Jess Springle. I'm an LPC in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm also an LPC in New Jersey. Um, I treat folks with eating disorders. That's the majority of my caseload, but I also treat folks with um, a bunch of other things, including trauma, folks who are neurodivergent, um, folks who are LGBTQ, uh, and those are my favorite, po favorite populations. Um, I am also a group facilitator for the Alliance um, and love working for the Alliance. And in fact, I'm like wrapping my shirt today. And what else do I do? Um, I complain on the internet a lot, and that's, I'd say that's about it. That's part of my job description as well. <laughs> well, you're also the parent to some very cute cats. And if anybody doesn't follow Jess, she has the most amazing memes Monday that literally, I think I snapshot like at least 15 of them every every Monday and send them to all my friends. So please make sure to follow these okay. incredible, incredible humans. <laughs> Um, so let's get to this conversation. Um, and Mina, I would love to start the conversation um, with you. You know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And here at the organization, our goal really is to ensure that eating disorders are part of the general mental health conversation, because so often they're not. They're oftentimes um, left out. I think personally, and, and I, I think you can agree with me on this, that mental health is still surrounded by so much, so much shame and stigma. How do we go about normalizing these conversations and making it okay to ask for support, reach out for help? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that there's still so much stigma. I think we've moved a long way, however, over the last few years, but I do think there's still a lot of work to do. And I do think that educating ourselves is just pretty much a big role in how we can minimize stigma and learn to be supportive of to other people. I find often when it comes to having conversations around destigmatizing mental health, it falls on the people who are struggling with mental health disorders to do all the heavy lifting. And I do think that it's time for people who may not relate 
who may not be aware to do a lot of work themselves to understand people who are different from them and to understand terms and concepts or even experiences that you may never, you can't relate to, have never gone through. And just that's what community care is about, you know? And I do think that I personally want to see the needle being moved by people learning to educate themselves instead of relying on those who are oppressed, relying on those who are struggling to do the educational work for them. So I do think it's a mix of us continuously being vocal about our struggles and not silencing ourselves, combating shame and doing the work of moving past that discomfort and fear because it's understandable why it exists. But I do think if we can move past it and be more vocal about our stories that plays a role in shifting the, the conversation but I also think people need to listen and they need to do the work of educating themselves so that we can collectively heal as a society oh so true Mina thank you so so much and I, I what you know what you just said specifically about it always tends to fall on the humans that are experiencing it that are going through it to have to use their voice and I think there's there's something that's so special about you know having lived experience and being able to to use that voice from that perspective but I want to be very direct that not everyone is able to do that and yet their voices still deserve to be heard and so Jess, I know, um, I know, I wanted to to you know bring the conversation into into eating disorders specifically, but I'm just I'm I'm wondering if how do people that may not that may not be experiencing eating disorders or mental health disorders how can they be good allies? How can they take the steps to educate themselves? So, like what Mina said, that they can they can be the ones to help move the needle forward. It's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think with I know we're not talking about eating disorders, but with eating disorders, a lot of the time um, I do encourage like my clients for their families or their loved ones um, to attend like say alliance groups for family and loved ones or to like seek out resources. But I think especially with eating disorders, it is hard to actually find the good resources sometimes. And I think that is the case, unfortunately, with a lot of mental health. Like Some of the resources are not always going to be helpful or positive. Um, but I think sometimes just starting with the source. So, you know, say you have a friend or a family member that is struggling and asking them, like, how can I best support you? Or even just coming to them with, hey, this is what I've learned. Like, is this supportive for you? Mm -hmm. Versus encouraging them to do the work. Because, yeah, I think with a lot of mental health, if folks who are struggling, and I see this a lot, say, with, like, National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, folks just feel like they need to sort of, like, almost like just dump onto like their own stories onto social media or just to anyone because they feel like they have to do that in order for awareness to be raised or for people to understand. And it's so much energy for people to expend when there's plenty of information and, and education that's around us and available. Um, it shouldn't always have to come from folks who are suffering. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, we know that only one in three, you know, humans that will experience an eating disorder will ever receive access to care. It's, it's the thing that keeps me up at night. It's actually the reason why I founded the organization so many moons ago. And, you know, the thing that probably will keep me in this field um, till I take my last breath. Um, we know that access to care yeah, unfortunately, with eating disorders, with general mental health seems to be a luxury in this country, actually around the globe, truthfully. And even though it's a necessity that, you know, just as we, um, you know, access care for our physical health, we should be able to access care for our mental health. What can we do as individuals that care or individuals that are activists to help folks access care um, and ensure that they get the help and support that they need. Um, Jess, I'd love to start with you and, and then Mina throw it to you after. The, the first thing that comes to mind, um, so Eating Disorder Coalition every year hosts an advocacy day, which is an opportunity for activists. It's not just for professionals, but uh, it is woefully um, under, um, under attended by professionals. Um, and it's an opportunity to speak to legislators in your state about ways in which um, eating disorders can be better covered by insurance or just really more a part of the conversation in terms of any sort of mental health legislation or parity. Um, and I mean, I only started 
full disclosure, I only started attending um, several years ago when it moved virtually. And I thought that was, it really was a, it's a life changing day. And it's really an amazing opportunity to put yourself in the conversation as an activist, as a person with lived experience, as a professional, it really makes you feel like you're doing something incredible um, to make a change um, so far as access is concerned. Um, I know personally, as someone who works in private practice, it can be really hard to make care accessible and also make a living. Um, so, you know, I do donate my time to the Alliance and work for um, work for y'all, which is my favorite thing. And um, just being involved with organizations that actually care um, about individuals and want to help provide access just makes a big difference. Um, even you know having this conversation right now actually improves access on some level because we're bringing it into the conversation, which again, I think it's just woefully under talked about. And I think we just need to make a point of talking about it more. Yeah, absolutely. Mina, I would love, I would love to hear from you as far as like accessing care and what can we do, you know, in order to, to push that proverbial needle forward so that more folks are able to access mental health services. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the things just said, I resonate with and I agree with. And I also think, though, expanding our definition of care. Because I do think when we hear the word, the term mental health, we automatically think therapy as the only solution to caring for our mental health. And I do think it's important for us to recognize the different systems at play that do impact our mental health mm -hmm. and the different ways we need to be cared for to be able to take care of our mental health. So I think everything just said makes total sense around like how we can advocate for ourselves and legislation changes and all those different things, um, reaching out to our electoral officials, all those things that can happen on a community level. But I also think access to care looks like what do we do with the housing crisis? Access to care looks like poverty, dismantling poverty, food banks, all those different things. Access to care could look like making childcare accessible <laughs> for working women, working moms, you know? Mm -hmm. So who think that as I say these things, I know it's fully loaded, but I'm saying it because I also think it's so important for us to expand how we see care, even in the context of green spaces, even in the context of pollution. Mm -hmm. We know we're dealing with climate change. The pandemic hit. I'm in New York City. Everybody left New York City because we know how mm -hmm. congested and polluted the city is <laughs> and how we lack green spaces. And it's not on a physical side, our mental health can be suffering from the lack of care that's happening in our environment as well. Also thinking of community violence, thinking of food apartheid, thinking of communities that do not have access to many things because of their region, thinking of redlining. So I know I'm going a little deep here, but I'm <laughs> going in this direction because I do think that care, yeah. um, the way we see care is very one-sided and it's very specific to sign up for a therapist and this is the end all be all. Mm -hmm. And as a therapist myself, I know that's not true because I can't help a client meditate their way out of poverty. You understand? And so I do think yeah. that important that we think about what care actually is so that when we are trying to make actionable steps toward change, we have different things that we're looking at and different perspectives that we're taking in that's necessary for maintaining someone's mental health. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much for that. And, you know, as, as you were, you, as you were speaking, Mina, you know, I was thinking, I actually just right before this, we were doing some work around food insecurity and the amount of individuals that are food insecure that have eating disorders. We estimate around 17% of all individuals that are food insecure will experience an eating disorder. And yet there's still that, you know, archaic stereotype of like eating disorders only affect, you know, affluent individuals when it, it's actually the furthest from the um, truth. And as we're having these conversations of like, well, what can we do? You know, well, we need to make sure that, that folks have access to food first and foremost and, 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 and good quality food, as well as what kind of services can we provide some really great free, uh, like amazing services where can they come to our groups? Can they, can they get connected to other services? You know, there's only so much we can do. And I think activism, I think, you know, pushing that needle forward means trying to find each and every way that we can support humans as human beings and for everything, everything that they need. And I know it's going to take us time, but we need conversations like this because just a hundred percent conversations like this does like they do make a difference. 
and it's up to us, it's up to our community, those individuals that are watching this to be part of the change because it's going to take all of us to move this mountain. And as I say all the time, like I never woke up one morning and looked out the window and, and said, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to have anxiety. I'm going to have depression. I'm going to have an eating disorder. And yet still to this day, I'm treated that way. And I know how much privilege I sit in. And yet, so we need to do everything we can to destigmatize mental illness, to destigmatize eating disorders, and to do everything we can to to make a change, to, to change the current. Because as we're having this conversation, folks are dying. And that's really what it comes down to. And they deserve better. Our community deserves better. So thank you both um, for, for um, those beautiful answers. Um, speaking out for for therapy because as we were getting ready for this conversation we, we sort of put it out to our community and and one question in particular um someone asked like why is therapy so important you know and of course in the construct of you know, you know not everybody has access of, are you guys there i think my internet cut out for a second you good yes okay better um is you know not everybody will have access um, to care, but um, why is therapy necessary or very important on on the journey of recovery? Would you say, Mina? I think therapy is important because I do think that sometimes, depending on the things that we've experienced and that we have gone through, we need to be able to sit with someone who can hold space for us, but also who is trained to give us the resources and the tools that we need to work through our traumas, to work through our depression, and to work through the different things that we are experiencing as people. You know, I also want to say that people don't only go to therapy because they're experiencing a major mental health disorder. It could be I'm moving across state and I don't know what to expect. So I just want someone I can talk to about it. Or I am transitioning jobs and it makes me a little nervous. I'm dealing with a lot of transitions in general. You know, so I do think sometimes we need a person who can guide us on our journey, who is professionally trained to help us one, label certain things that we don't even realize. Well, maybe I feel this way because it is anxiety. Maybe these things that are happening to me are symptoms and signs of depression. It's important to know that a therapist and a friend are not the same. Our friends often give us advice from a place of bias and from a place that is rooted in their own values as well. And a therapist is trained to be able to work through their own biases and not project those things onto you, which is why it's intended to be a safe space that's not full with judgment or projection or things like that. And it's really to help you reflect on your own decisions, your own choices, and your own life and what's best for you. So I personally think we all can benefit from therapy. Um, I think that there's no harm and even trying it, you know? I think that if you are conflicted, give it a chance. Talk to someone who's having a good experience in therapy and also understand that when you sign a contract to be in therapy, you're not signing your life away. You're just signing an agreement that you are this person's client you're going through your confidentiality clauses, all those different things. And if you decide that this isn't for you, you can stop at any time. It's not an end-all, be-all practice. But I do think that it's something that can benefit us and help us become more emotionally mature. It can increase our emotional intelligence and also just give us the language and the tools that we need to just be human. I, I love that. And, you know, it's so interesting. I was actually at my, my internist yesterday for my yearly checkup and I was talking to my doctor and, and, you know, I was talking to her just about like mental health awareness month. And I, I shared with her, I'm like, could you imagine if we had access like through our insurance, like if you have certain types of insurance where you had preventative care as far as mental health as you as so as people that do have access to insurance do like they don't just wait till they're sick to go to the doctor they go for prevention reasons just to make sure everything is okay I really believe and I hope one day that I'm able to see it where insurance panels will actually cover mental health sessions in the same way that they cover you know like your your yearly checkup because you know, I think that that therapy has this idea of like, you only go, as you said, Mina, like the house is on fire. But we're human beings being human in a world that's not exactly easy. And I want to just sort of hold space for 
the heaviness of the world in this moment, in this day and age right now, because I know that a lot of people are hurting deeply right now for uh, so many things going on. And I agree, like therapy, when you have access to it, which I believe all humans should have access to, can be a game changer, not just for when things are not going well, but when things are going always, like all different ways. So on this topic, just wondering, um, we talk oftentimes about red flags, and, and we don't necessarily talk about green flags, which it's good that I have like a much younger team because they, 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 they tell me everything that's like, that's like going on right now. So we've talked, we've been talking a lot about green flags. So what are some green flags when looking for a clinician, knowing that there's many layers, but if you had access, what were some, some green some green flags? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. I love the green flags and red flag conversation that seems to have taken over Twitter um, in the last year. I think um, it's going to be different for every person. Um, you know, something that might be a green flag for one person very much may not be a green flag for another person. And that's always something that I like to hold space for even during like a consult call and remind folks like, hey, I might not be the right fit for you. And that's totally okay. And like, I would so much rather you get good care than my ego stand in the way. Um, and even that, like, personally, if, you know, if I were to see a provider and I felt like, oh, this isn't a good fit. And if they said something like that to me, that would be a green flag. Um, but I think also, it, again, it really depends on your, say, like your identities, what you're struggling with. Um, and, you know, because I know that a lot of my clients, for example, um, you know, they would really want to, some of them would really prefer to see, say, like a queer provider. Um, and, it, I think that that's completely reasonable, you know, or someone who's um, visibly queer versus like, I am queer, but I know that for a lot of folks, it's not visible, not visible. Um, but I think other green flags just like generally, and I think in the eating disorder space as well, um, someone who is committed to social justice, I think that's just a huge, hugely important point. Um, and I don't think that's actually just specific to eating disorders. I think that's specific to folks who work in mental health um, and really just have seem genuinely do seem to approach mental health from a human rights perspective like therapy is political i think that pretending it's not is nonsense um and it's also just a deeply personal experience so i know that for me um you know i would want like the therapist that i see like i want her to be human in the room i don't want her to be someone who is just like nodding her head at me for an hour which that's fine, you know, if that is something that a person wants. But, you know, I think a green flag can be someone who is authentic and is not going to just sit there and be like, oh, yeah, okay. Like someone is going to call you out on your bullshit, which, again, a lot of folks with eating disorders need. Um, and I know, you know, historically, certainly I've needed and still do at times. And I just think that that's hugely important. I know that's not like a very specific answer. So I'm sorry, it's not like an itemized list or anything. But um, it is, it is hard to answer it generally. I think it is just very specific. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think you you answered it beautifully. Mina, I'm wondering if you have any any thoughts on on green flags when you because for a lot of folks that, that reached out when we were asking, it's like, how do you know if it's a good fit? How do you know if this is the right human for you? Yeah, I, I relate to everything just said. I think it's deeply personal. I think I would, instead of labeling it as red or green flags, I think I would encourage the person to really reflect on what makes them feel safe in the midst of them being vulnerable. Um, because as Jess said, what might make me feel safe may be different for someone else. Um, and so when it comes to having your needs met in a conversation and just being able to talk to someone, what are some signs that you pay attention to that makes you feel like it's safe to have a conversation with this person? And I would go from there. You know, I think it is a little easier to list out the red flags, such as if your therapist is falling asleep in session, if your therapist is chronically... Oh session i think those are like often easy to share because they're like blatant warning signs <laughs> they're the green ones i think it's just so deeply personal that i think i would just encourage people to reflect before they go in when you have experience being in conversation with people so think about friends think about family when i share this thing with this person i get very upset when they respond to me this particular way that shows me when I'm in conversation with someone and I'm being vulnerable, I do not like it when 
fill in the blank. So when I'm in a session with a therapist, are they doing the same behaviors that other people in my life might be doing that might make me feel uncomfortable? The only other thing I will add is, however, the therapeutic space is a beautiful space because it is a space that allows you to confront those things to your therapist that you may not be able feel comfortable confronting to a friend or a family member. So I also would just add to that, that even in the midst, if you are in a space where it felt green and now I'm on a, <laughs> I feel like we're transitioning to yellow, I'm a little cautious, call it out, name it. You are in a, in a, in a safe space where you're working with someone who is there to work through discomfort. You know, and so I would just encourage you that even if it starts off feeling green and now you're in a position where you're like, uh, I'm seeing some cautionary signs here, talk about it and address it because that's what the therapeutic space is for, to give you the tools so that when you're not in therapy, there are going to be times where you feel uncomfortable in conversations and you're developing those skills with your actual therapist. And I think it's freeing to say, hey, therapist, whatever your therapist's name is, you know, when you said that, thing to me or when you did this thing it made me feel unheard it made me feel this way can we talk about it and I want people to remember too that that is what the therapeutic space is for as well I love that reminder and the one thing that I also just as, as you were sharing is that there's no right way or perfect way to do to do um, therapy. There's no right way to do recovery. There's not what works, maybe a therapeutic approach that works for me is not going to work for another person. There's not like a one size fits all for just as like internal medicine, mental health. It's all like, and that's why I'm so grateful that there's so many different approaches out there, that there's so many different clinicians out there. And as Hopefully one day we'll get the access to care and then folks can go to the, to the right providers for them because I also want to hold space for individuals that are only able to see a certain type of provider um, because of insurance, because of other things. Um, and knowing that, um, listen, I think what I think both of you shared so beautifully was listening to what your voice internally is saying too. Like more than anything, the therapeutic space needs to be a safe one because you know you're going to be doing a lot of unpacking a lot of work a lot of learning a lot of unlearning um and so making sure that you know it is safe and and being aware that it's not going to happen overnight it's not going to be one size fits all and thank goodness there's all different humans out there for all different humans so i really love that um one of the things i wanted to ask you and then b before we um wrap up is you know i know that I alluded to it, but that this time is super heavy for a lot of people, you know, we're coming off of, you know, two years of the pandemic, there's a lot of things going on in the world, a lot of things going on in this country. Um, and, and I want to ask both of you this, um, for, for someone who's having a hard time, would love to hear from you one or two tools that has been either helpful for you personally, or something that you've seen be very helpful for your clients um, during this time to be able to continue to put um, one, one foot in front of the other. So Mina, I'm, I'm wondering if you could step in with this, like some helpful tools for folks that are listening right now. Yeah, um, so I would say the first thing is either writing or audio journaling is something that I find to be a very useful tool that my clients have, as well as that I have been using on my own. Um, journaling, I think, is a very straightforward practice. I think a lot of us are familiar with that. But I do think that there are some people who deeply struggle with, I'm going to open up a journal and just pour things out. So I like to recommend setting a theme around your journaling. Maybe it could be a journal that's specifically for gratitude journaling or an intention setting journaling or even a goal setting journal. You know, something that is very specific that still allows you to release something and make space for something as well. Now, audio journaling is something that I started working with clients and sharing with them during once the pandemic started because a lot of people were just sitting at home in silence. And because a lot of people were overwhelmed, not many people wanted to communicate, not many people with Zoom fatigue, nobody wanted to do FaceTime. So a lot of people were just like, I don't want to answer my phone. I don't want to do the texting. I just, just want to sit here in peace. Um, and so the audio journaling comes in where you literally just record yourself talking out loud. 
And the reason why that's been so helpful is because when you play it back, you're able to listen to the discrepancies in your thinking. So think about how we normally would call a friend up to vent and to share. And that friend is usually the person to hear the discrepancies, discrepancies and say, you know, that thing doesn't make too much sense right now. Or maybe you should look at it from this perspective. Often I do think that we can be very stuck in our heads often. And so what we may need is a release and we're used to talking to someone about it. But in the space where you do not have the capacity to, I would highly recommend recording yourself, playing it back. And sometimes you might hear certain things that you're realizing this doesn't make any sense. Or actually maybe I'm overreacting. Or maybe there's a cognitive distortion here. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I think has been very helpful is healthy escapism. I think a lot of us have coping <laughs> techniques, but some of our coping techniques may not necessarily also be beneficial mm -hmm. for our mental health and our healing. I don't think that we need to expose ourselves to the news 24 hours a day. I don't think we need to be doom scrolling on social media. I think whatever is happening in the world, though it is tragic, we're going to find out about it. And I don't think that we need to be turned on 24-7 to feel like that's the only way that I can make change in the world. Mm -hmm. I do think that self-care is learning to have boundaries and to protect yourself from things that are activating you or triggering you. And so I think healthy escapism is something that can be very beneficial. I highly recommend people to swap out self-help books for fiction. I would ha highly recommend swapping out documentaries and reality, reality TV for a sci-fi movie, for something that's rooted in fiction. And I say that because, one, I think as adults, we forget to have fun. Number two, when we're talking about mental health, we treat ourselves like we're self-development projects. And yeah. three, number three, we assume that in order to heal, we need to just be exposed to information over and over and over again. And we're not even giving ourselves the space to consume it as well as implement certain changes in our lives. And I think it's because we're realizing all this information we're feeding ourselves doesn't really do much for us. So I think when we engage in healthy escapism, we're able to discern what information applies to me right now versus what doesn't. But also we just need that disconnect at times because and let me tell you something, while we're on this live, reality is still happening around us, <laughs> you know? And so I would just encourage you to find ways that you can utilize healthy practices um, that causes you to disengage from things that you know might be triggering you or activating you. I, I love that. And I will tell you several weeks back, we talked um, to the fabulous Jesse Israel and he was talking about, you know, meditation. He was talking about, and something that he said, he's like, you know, think about how often your phone is the last thing that you look at before you go to bed. And like first thing you do when you wake up. And it was really interesting because I was, I was just aware and I have literally stopped looking at my phone before bed. And I just in the morning now use my phone for my alarm, but I don't look at it. I give myself 10 minutes. And I know that that, that might not sound like anything, but the minute like I would open my eyes and the minute before I would close my eyes, I would look at the phone. And so I was always like, T like tied in and it's not giving us that that break that that pause and so I love that reminder and the only other thing um that I would just say before Jess I would love for you to hop in is for a lot of folks that are watching they might approach journaling as like this I have to do it perfectly it has to be this way there's no rules with journaling and that's what I love about just you know how you like how you talked about that daunting like way of just opening up that journal and like you know one of thing one of the things that my therapist back in the day challenged me to do is like I can't stand crossing things out like my my black or white in my brain won't let me do that but just freeform, just write. If you make mistakes, let it be. This is your space for you. So I really love that. Um, Jess would love to hear um, some of your favorites. Yeah, a lot. I mean, a lot of repeats. But um, you know, I, journaling is even personally something that I've done probably for, oh God, I think I found a journal recently from when I was like 10. And it's just hilarious to read. And I, I like to think about journaling in that way. It's like, this is a snapshot of what life is like in this moment. And even if you're writing things that don't really feel particularly important, like you can look back and 
um, hopefully in a healthy and positive way, because um, I do like to revisit some of my old journals and just be like, oh, well, like, look at this thing that was happening for me then, and like, look at where I am now, and it's so different. Um, I do like to have a little bit more structure to my journaling. Um, I usually do like, um, like three not so great things that happened today, three better things that happened today, and like one intention for tomorrow, um, especially if I'm having trouble organizing my thoughts, and I usually share that with clients as well. Um, I think um, during this time especially, um, you know, a lot of my clients are like, just shut up um, whenever I talk about mindfulness, but I do think that mindfulness is really important and helpful. Um, and there are so many ways to access it now that it's become a bit of a buzzword. I do know that. And um, what I mean by mindfulness is just being a little bit more present in your everyday life. Um, and there are, I love that there are apps for it now. Like there's every imaginable app you can think of for mindfulness. Um, and I actually heard of one recently. It's called Finch. It's like a self-care um, self care app that does like mindfulness goals, self-care goals. And it's just like, like little cute birds. Um, and I don't know. I think that is like so helpful to me if there's like a cute animal that that's like my number one. Um, another thing that I talk, talking about, you know, really structuring your um, phone usage or social media access. I mean, I know that for me, I have to like set a schedule for myself and I will do so on my phone so that it kind of cuts me off. Um, if, if I'm like engaging too much, too much, um, but also, like, if I am noticing myself, like, not really being able to look away from my phone, um, I'll pull up, like, accounts that are more animal-focused or more, like, meme-focused so that at least, like, the time I am spending scrolling is more, quote-unquote, productive in that it's giving my mind some serotonin instead of just the constant, like, just suffering scrolling. Um, that is something that these are all things I use personally and things I like to share with my clients. Um, and interestingly, I think, you know, clients have taught me a lot during this time about what is useful and what can be helpful when you're stuck indoors or just really trying to cope with the um, just really challenging world we live in today. So, yeah, I love that. Thank you both so, so much. Um, well, I have no idea where the last time has gone. And, and I'm just I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Um, I did want to mention some upcoming conversations. So a week from today, we're having an amazing conversation on um, destigmatizing mental health and eating disorders within the Asian community. And then two weeks from today, on Mental Health Action Day, we're having a conversation surrounding um, male identifying folks and eating disorders. And then we're going to end the month um, with navigating weight stigma within the healthcare space. So please um, join us for these amazing conversations. Um, and of course, please contact the National Alliance for Eating Disorders if there's anything that we can do to connect you to care or join one of our free therapist-led support groups. Um, before we leave though, one last question for um, each of you. Um, what is one thing that you would share with our listeners um, right now? just in this moment that might be having a hard time, just one little pearl before um, we log off. Um, Mina, would love to, to start with you. Mm, these questions are always hard because I have like a list of 15 things that I want to say. Um, <laughs> so to boil it down to one, I think for people who are having a hard time right now, it sounds cliche, but I do want to remind people that they're not alone um, in their struggles. Because I do think sometimes when we're struggling, we can isolate ourselves and not reach out for help because we think we're a burden. We think something's wrong with us. And I think it's really just to import, important to remind ourselves, I'm not the only one experiencing this thing. Even if I don't know anyone in particular, there's someone out there who understands what I'm feeling and what I'm going through. And that's enough for me to get the help that I need. I love that. Thank you. Jess? That was mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's like the therap therapist Rolodex. We have like, you know, kind of <laughs> circling bunch. Um, the, the thing that comes to mind outside of that is, you know, no person is a final draft. Um, someone said that to me when I graduated high school and it stuck with me. Um, and something that I think is just so relevant for today's world. It's, you know, you're a different, we're a different people every day. And that is such a, 
a terrifying prospect, but also such an amazing one that, you know, the person we are today is not who we have to be tomorrow and, or the person we have to be after that. And there's just so much left for you and so many different, different drafts left for you to be. I love that. I love that, that you're not the final draft. I think that's a, such a beautiful way to, to end today's conversation. So um, on behalf of the National Alliance for Eating Disorders, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Mina, Jess, thank you for just being who you are and what you do. Um, and please, if you don't follow both of them, please do. I cannot wait for your book to come out next year, Mina. Like, we'll have to do all the things to promote it. <laughs> Um, you know, and I'm just, thank you for, um, just for, for being the humans that you are and doing so much good in, in my world and in all of our worlds. So please take care of yourself. Please stay safe. And, uh, we look forward to having you at a future conversation. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.